Hey, so I'm Paul Carlson, CPA. I'm gonna be walking through just some ideas on metrics and KPIs and different tools you can use to come away from the conference and go back to your firms to build momentum within the marketing, sales, and legal production functions of your firms. A um, Couple starting comments is the slides are full of detailed tables with numbers. And of course, the presentation from the accountant is gonna have pictures of Excel in it. So if you want a copy of the slide deck, go ahead and send me an email, which will be up on, here we go. So just send me an email. Jane Phillips, our director of accounting is here. So if you want to toss her a business card or give me a card, we're happy to share the slide deck with you when we're done. Um, do you want to card with a couple notes just kind of tying back to other conversations we've seen through the conference so far? that, you know, it's not part of this slide, but just as law firm CFO, we see things that cause trouble within firms. So one is the push to flat fees. I understand the market wants it. We're hearing thought leaders pushing it. It's just very difficult when we have clients who come back from conferences or events, very excited and jump into a lot of flat fees and then it's nine months later and they've created quite the financial pickle that we need to help them dig out of. That be very careful with shifting anything into flat fees. And the pieces that we've learned is if you're gonna do flat fees, you have to be very strict on scope of work. So you need to define exactly what you're gonna do. And that's the one you hear pretty commonly the one that's a surprise is you need to also control the time of the engagement. So the folks who get really squashed are the flat fee immigration cases where those difficult cases can stretch into years to get completed. And sometimes the clients have to provide a lot of documents or just other resources that they're not excited about providing. And so if you have to go back and restart that case six times because the client's not cooperating, there's no way you're gonna make realization on that case. So you need to define the flat fee, you need to define the time, and then if you're not, if the client's not making their timelines, you have to be ready to go back to them and say, hey, you missed your part of the deal, so here's our change order. Here's the additional fee we're gonna charge you for not doing this which kind of rolls into the next piece, is firms also struggle with scope creep, which is where they sell the bronze estate plan and the client just keeps demanding and pushing them into delivering the silver or gold plan. So you have to control those conversations and if you're not the personality to tell the client, like, wait a minute, this is not our original deal, we need additional fees, implementing the flat fee program is going to be difficult. And then the other one, we work with some firms, they're just some amazingly kind folks, it's the scope seep issue. That they sell the bronze plan, they know the client needs something else, so they go ahead and start doing that additional work behind the scenes. It's never communicated to the client, they're just throwing it in because they see that it's needed and they're trying to avoid the conversation with the client. So just be very careful there. Um, the other concern is that 5% marketing number just doesn't seem right. That, well, I understand that they probably calculated the number correctly, but it's a miss right now. That we see we're in an era right now where for organic SEO, Google My Business marketing opportunities, PI got very competitive many years ago. Most other practice areas, it seems everyone's asleep. And so we're seeing a lot of just working with our clients that if we can match that firm with a good marketing agency, they can go in and capture market share very quickly at this point. So, you know, criminal defense firm, help them find a new marketing agency. Marketing agencies are just doing what they're supposed to they go ahead and put a new office in a second location and they're in the three pack in three weeks. And so there's a big opportunity there. On the flip side of firms being asleep is there's a lot of firms that have rankings in the three pack or they have organic rankings just because they got lucky. 
that we will will do the analysis on their sites and we'll say like there's no reason they should be ranking like this and what happens is something happens with a google algorithm update and suddenly their lead volume will drop in a week so we had a 20 person firm last algorithm update in october leads just dropped in half because their marketing agency was taking tons of shortcuts the firm was positioned poorly and then they got a big surprise um on the marketing agency difficulty big part of my job for this year has been helping firms find new marketing agencies that over time you know as cfo i see my job as roughly tied to making revenue move and to make revenue move and legal is finding leads. And so I've learned how to use the same SEO tools that the marketing agencies use. And it's just something I've dabbled with for a long time that we can look at what the marketing agency is doing. And there's so many of them that are not doing what they're supposed to, to actually make the firm rank. So some firms they're spending the 5% on marketing, but they're really getting 0% return, which puts them in a difficult position that they're going to get a surprise. Um, and if, so we're pushing for 10% of revenue on effective marketing. There's other coaching groups that are pushing 20% that you maybe don't need. I mean, this kind of give you a picture of what's happening in your community that if the neighbor firm goes into one of those groups and realizes, Hey, there's this opportunity here they're going to start putting those resources and start grabbing leads. And then I'm not sure how true this is or not, but well, I guess we can see that there's agencies who are buying and selling leads. There's a couple downstairs, but Arizona has where the alternative business structure state. So I think the noise we're hearing is the marketing agencies are starting law firms out of Arizona with the plan to do SEO on a nation national level and then fee split the leads back to other firms. The danger with that is they're gonna have a lot more margin and a lot more resources to keep dumping into their SEO resources to grab those leads. So I guess the takeaway is there's an opportunity here if you're outside of PI to really push into marketing once you find a decent agency and grab some territory before the land rush is over. All right. So shifting into slides and regular presentation here. So kind of in the spirit of the James Clear doing, getting better at things, getting 1% better every day, I think we have a long list of suggestions or ideas of things to go back to your firm and start focusing on that. And then also just kind of, it just increasing momentum that to make the firm pop, we need marketing to fly, we need sales to go, and we need production to keep up. So a lot of these concepts came from us doing financial meetings with a couple larger firms. Financials were great. We had the financial models were set up and ready to go. There was no connection from our financial projections to actually what was happening within the firm that just weren't talking. So started experimenting a little bit with some of the business operating systems. So entrepreneurial operating system or EOS is popular. Scaling up was kind of the predecessor and that's still around. A lot of folks are now switching over to pinnacle concepts, but it's these ideas like here's a structured way to run a business. And one of the core underpinnings of all of them is to create a scorecard with those metrics you need to see on a weekly basis, weekly, monthly basis to make sure that the firm is on track. So what we're gonna walk through today are a lot of the metrics and the KPIs that we regularly put on those scorecards for firms and we help them monitor. You know, so marketing, we wanna see performance of where our leads are coming from. We wanna take better care of our referral partners. We wanna to try to connect collected fees into each of those sources. For sales, we wanna start tracking how our intake folks are doing and our salespeople. And then on production, we have a weekly available dollars report that works great for um, hourly firms, production ratios. And then we have a kind of advise a good way to use a report to manage the firm's trust account 
that for hourly firms, we can get rid of accounts receivable. So we have several family law firms that have no AR issues. Let's kind of jump in. All right. Oh, so the reports we're going to look at that a lot of these reports, you just can't go into Clio and click a button and have the report come out. It seems that most folks, you've been in Clio long enough, you learn the trick that you put some fields on a, in this table, you put some fields in this other table, you export it all out to Excel, and then you do lookups to combine the data to get the reports that you're gonna see. There's some tools that are starting to do this. Um, Clio Manage is turning on better custom reporting. Clio Grow is turning on some reporting. So I think the process to get to the data is gonna change quite a bit over the next year, but it's the idea of the conversation and what we're looking at. All right, so marketing. So first piece is we wanna see where leads are coming from. So what we do to drive that is I've mocked this up in Clio Manage. We wanna add a custom field for referral partner name. So if a lead is a referral, and then if we also wanna create a field where we're tracking lead sources. And what that looks like all right, so this is the report we wanna start looking at on a weekly basis, because this data is very hard to collect. It's always soft, and so we need to keep this front and center. To fit things on the screen, there's two columns that I didn't include. So the other ones that should be here is the referral originator. So typically firms that have structured referral processes will have a partner or person in the firm is responsible for that referral partner relationship. And so, you know, if the referral came from Ruby and Jane is the partner who talks to Ruby, we wanna see Jane's name on, the, on that row. And then the referral coach, so Stacy Brad Randall that we've directed a lot of clients to, we work with, you know, you wanna get those thank you cards out the same day that referral comes in. We all get very distracted and busy and those referral, those thank you cards just don't seem to go out the door. So if we put a thank you card date on this report and everyone looks at it every week, they seem to get done. Um, so a lot of this data could be pulled from your CRM, but we're just kind of do it from this system or from, sorry, from Clio Manage for a moment. Okay. And I also skipped a note here. So there's a question though of, do we track this origination detail at the client level or at the matter level? That one of the things we're looking for because it's such a, an important lead source is we wanna keep track of which matters come from returning clients. So we have a new lead come in, it's a referral from Ruby so that's gonna be referral from Ruby for this period. But then we do a really good job with that client and the client comes back in two years and asks us to do additional work. I wanna see a report where that second case comes back as a returning client lead type so we can make sure just that we're doing everything we can to have those clients come back. I believe the way Clio Grow has been programmed is that lead source is assigned at the client level. So when you look at those metrics, that is always gonna be referral, even though one case was a referral and one case is a returning client. And they're changing that quickly. Um, but then on the flip side, if you're a corporate firm and you have that new client come in and that client's gonna have new, 10 new cases every month, those types of firms, it sometimes makes sense to put that detail on the client. So it's just a matter of trying to match this to telling the story you need from your marketing firm, or sorry, to telling the story of what's happening within your company. So once we have this data, now we can start to do monthly reports on counts of referral activity. So this gets interesting is that we will usually have firms make a, I'll call it a marketing grid. So I want them to go into a Google sheet put down a row for every marketing campaign or strategy they're pursuing. And then let's put a dollar budget next to each one and let's put a time budget next to each one. And so let's take that marketing grid and let's compare it to the results that we're seeing. 
And let's see if there's a connection. Are we, you know, are those efforts really turning into leads? Or let's start looking for holes or for gaps. Like, are we doing something to create new referral partners seems to be a common hole. Now that we have that lead data, that leader, sorry, we have the origination data, sorry, we have the attribution data in Clio. Now we can go into the revenue report and we can pull the collections by each matter, export that to Excel, pull in the lead attribution data, and then combine these so we can start to see revenue by each campaign. And so if you are, so if you're working from a, if you're working with a Google ads manager, you're, you're doing paid ads. This is the report that that um, agency should be reviewing with you. That'd be very careful that if you're working with paid Google ads, LSA ads, or, you know, Facebook ads or any other paid traffic, that the agencies like to talk about how many impressions you got, how many clicks you got, they will rarely go in and ask you what was the legal fees you actually collected from these new engagements. That when we start pushing into this, we'll regularly find firms where their return on Google ad spend is less than one. So they're spending a dollar on Google ads and they're bringing in less than a dollar in fees. So when they turn those off, their net income actually increases. The trouble is some of the better agencies are actually asking for access to the firm's CRM so they can start doing this process and other agencies aren't interested. But you really, if you have significant dollars going into paid traffic, needs to be tied into collected fees over time. And now we can start to do campaign ROI. So this is where we can take the revenue by campaign from the prior slide and let's start to compare that to the cost or the investment we put into each of those campaigns. So the usual suspects on this is referrals always have a very high return. That we put a little bit of money and time into maintaining those referral relationships and we receive significant revenue. But there's always this disconnect that we'll ask firms like, can you put in a process where you can more put more structure around that referral process? and we get a lot of pushback. They're not interested in going forward when it's their biggest opportunity. Or let's put some structure around purposely going out and building new referral partners. And again, lots of resistance, even though it's the highest ROI. Usually when they start to see this after a while, they'll start to get the hint and start pursuing that. Um, the other very high ROI is those returning clients. If we can be charming and stay in touch with the clients, and we can see the exact dollars we're collecting from returning clients, it makes, you know, it kind of encourages us to continue to pursue them. The trouble ones that we've mentioned before are any of the paid traffic, that it's really difficult to get a positive return on those at this point. All right, so that was a conversation on a couple ideas on metrics and reports that you can use to go back and get some momentum going within your marketing function. It's really, let's get some data out of the system. Let's look at that data on a weekly basis and let's start making changes and updates into the marketing process. All right, sales. So here we're gonna to start to try, we're gonna try tracking results by intake specialist and by salesperson. And this is always popular, but I like to use SaaS sales terms for law firms. People resist this a lot, but we have so many firms that it seems like people forget the reason they're there. So intake specialist kind of sounds like it should be helping people bring, who've already signed their engagement letter bring in documents so they can get started, when really what we want that person to be is they want that person to be an SDR, and their primary role is to turn that lead into a scheduled consultation. And so if we start calling them an SDR, that helps them remember what their job is or their primary role. Um, the big surprise I had on this one for a long time is we had a firm 
that would burn through a receptionist every three months. Well, <laughs> I did. Well, what it turned out is the receptionist was the firm's in was their firm's SDR, and the firm was getting a hundred leads a day, and they were just overwhelmed with the volume and had and the person was expected to also be the receptionist at the same time. And I hear this consistently that we smush the receptionist responsibilities together with the SDR responsibilities. And now the legal trends report starts to make sense where people are calling firms and they never hear back. It's because we're not putting the resources into that department so we can get back to everyone. Um, and the other term is just salesperson. The person who does the consultation, being an attorney or non-attorney, that their whole goal there is to um, get that signed engagement letter. So we put in a couple of custom fields. And so here we have a custom field for the SDR. We put the custom field of salesperson and we put in a custom field of expected fee. And we'll see what that is helpful for in a moment. So here's what our report looks like, that here's all the new cases that came in last week. Um, if you're doing this more from the CRM, we want to do this at a lead level to start tracking close rates by person. But here we're just going to look at what new work came in. Um, from the CRM, I like to assign every case to a specific SDR and assign that lead to a salesperson and they're both responsible for closing the lead because we just see too many finger pointing that we had the consultation, the, the last three steps that need to be done to get that closed just are dropped and we're losing things because the attorney got busy, which we understand if you have to go to court, you gotta go to court. And the SDR is not realizing, oh, wait a minute, I just need to send two forms and I can get this closed. So we make them both responsible and then we start to track, you know, what was the sales from, you know, what was the sales by SDR last week? Because we can, we have this estimated sales value and we can also see what was sold by each salesperson last week. Um, to start an ongoing theme, if our firm's revenue target is $100,000 a month in revenue, we need to sell $25,000 of cases a week. So now we can start tracking what did we sell last week against a target and understand if we're on track or off track. And then for a longer term play, because again, we have these fields set and managed, we can go push out collections by matter, we can combine those together and we can start to track sales by SDR, I'm sorry, we can start to track collected fees by SDR, and we can track collected fees by salesperson. So what I'm looking for here is trends and comparisons. Do you have, I mean, everyone seems to at one point in their firm had that one SDR, it was just super charming. You could feel the smile through the phone and they're largely just closing cases themselves and the attorney's kind of just there to sign where you can see the comparisons on how much they're selling compared to other folks and prioritize them. Or even the attorneys, are, do you have an attorney who's consistently selling the bronze plan instead of the silver and you can see that reflected over time? All right, so to wrap up the sales component, is the general theme here is we want to start tracking results by SDR and start tracking results by salesperson and begin to push into the process and understand where are we losing people and where can we close more cases. We're going to shift into production concepts at this point. All right, so this is a tool that we use to track or monitor the production team. So what this is, is we export all the time entries, all the billable time entries by user on a weekly basis, push it to Excel, sum it, and then put those values into this Google Sheet that we prefer to push it to Excel instead of using the Clio reports because we can see the detail. 
We like this chart because we can see the longitudinal trends. We can see how people are doing across time. That if you have a timekeeper who misses their target for one week, you know, they had a tough, tough week, maybe they're out sick. If you have someone who's out for four weeks, who misses for four weeks in a row, there's something to miss. We need to go find what's going on and fix that. Um, the focus on billable dollars instead of hours is not traditional, but it certainly helps me drive revenue. Because every time we had a firm who's resisted this, they want to do hours, it's just nonstop surprises of like, you know, this timekeeper said they met their target based on hours, but we go into Clio and we look and, oh, they were working on old cases where the rates, they were on an old rate schedule. And so they missed their target because they were on old rates because no one had switched the matter to the new rates. Where, you know, so there's this disconnect of hours versus dollars. I also like the dollars piece because again, if we have that firm, where revenue goal is $100,000 a month, that tells me we need about $30,000 a week of time entries if we're losing a little bit in the billing and collections process. So if we have a bad week and you know, goal is 30, we only get 20, we can talk to the firm owner and say, you had a $10,000 deficit, that's gonna come out of your pocket. So do you wanna go talk to the people who are responsible for missing this today? And I get a lot more reaction out of that as opposed to saying billable hours, we miss billable hours by 20 hours. So there's just a lot stronger connection. All right, so shifting to another report. So here's that accounts receivable tool, the tool we can use to stop accounts receivable. So term we made up is a term called client balance. So what we're doing is we go in, we calculate how much money the client has in trust. We're going to subtract the amount they have in accounts receivable. We're going to subtract how much they have in unbilled time. And we're going to subtract how much they have in unbilled expenses. So largely what we're doing is if we had the closest case today, send out that final invoice, what's the balance that are we, you know, do, if we have a negative client balance, that means we're gonna send out an invoice for the accounts receivable amount or balance due. And we always have trouble collecting on those accounts receivable, where if those balances stay positive, we know we're okay. So here's an example of what that might look like. So the, when we introduce this to firms, the starting point we try to get them to is look at your client balances, run this on a weekly basis, hits zero, we either need to very quickly request additional trust funds or we need to stop work. That's this beginner point. The more advanced version of this is let's run this report every week. Let's have a quick chat with the responsible attorneys and say, is that client balance sufficient to get us through the next four to six weeks of this case? that the, where we usually see the surprises are a client will have a couple thousand dollars in trust. So people think we're okay, but then we find out that we're going to court next week on that case. And we're going to put 40 hours of time into that matter. And that $2,000 is nowhere near enough to cover it. And at that point we start to, you know, send out that trust request or we start to withdraw or we start to just put it to on hold. Um, we can also put some custom fields on here that if we, as a billing status, so if we have a case that's on hold, that everyone can see this on this report as it's coming out. And then we can also add the notes that if the firm office manager is intervening and sending out notes, they can put those in there. Um, the trick to making this work is we need to give the firm office manager or a central point the authority to run this report and start making decisions on whether or not this case needs to be put on hold. So the firm office manager is going to attorneys and saying, you know, we're underwater on this case. We need to go pencils down on this until we get the finances resolved. And this has been, this has worked tremendously that we have several family law firms who have started talking to us significant accounts receivable issues 
It's all gone. It's just a matter of having that hard conversation sooner than later. All right. So another fun one is payroll ratios. So what we're watching here is for each production timekeeper, we're doing a comparison of their wages divided by their collected fees. So if we pay someone a dollar, we collect four, their payroll ratio is 0.25. This is, we like to do the ratio like that because it ties to the income statement more, where this is just the inverse of the multiplier everyone's heard of. You know, otherwise the multiplier now would be four. So what that looks like is we create a report that has the collected fees, everyone's compensation, and then their ratios. And so within the financial models, we typically know where we need those ratios to be to hit our financial targets. Um, compensation is all comp. So any incentive comp goes in there. And so that makes it harder for them to hit their targets in the future, and that's fine. A note on collected fees out of Clio is it's very easy for Clio collected fees to be incorrect. So we won't rely on any of this until we know that we have Clio completely integrated with the accounting system. So we're bringing all the invoices over, bringing all the invoice payments over. We're using the accounting system to confirm the real collections number. And then we're comparing that to collected fees in Clio and if we're more than half a percent or a percent off, we have to go through Clio and find the difference. Because it's really easy to mark something paid in Clio where you never got the money, and then these ratios would be inflated. Um, we have a couple of firms who are actually tying this process into incentive comp. So the timekeeper's bonuses are based on their ratio. So if your ratio is within this band, you hit this bonus amount, if your ratio is within another band, you hit another bonus amount. And it's amazing the conversations that you will have paralegals and the support team start to have with you. That we're shifting now so everyone's on the same team that before firms are, would be providing incentive comp based on billable dollars. So, you know, so put as much time as you can into the system. Ignore the fact that we know that the client's underwater and can't pay, but go ahead and put the time in the system and we'll actually bonus you on those billable dollars. That doesn't work out well. We're in this system, we'll hear feedback from the paralegals and the attorneys who are assigned to work on a case. They'll see the trust money's not there and they'll go back to the partner and say, hey, I know you asked me to work on this. I can see that the case doesn't have the funding. How's this gonna work? Because I don't want this to hurt my bonus and so at this point, we've invited the entire team to be on the same side as the firm owner and actually um, focus on matter financial management. So get a little more friction up front, but again, attenuates accounts receivable surprises. And then kind of like wrapping this up here. So scorecards, I just went through a very long laundry list of all these KPIs that can be bewildering because you know, what am I supposed to do? It's Tuesday morning, I have this leadership meeting and this guy just told me to look at 30 metrics in different places. So this is an example scorecard out of 90.io, which is probably the most common tool used for EOS firms. And so we help firms identify what are the primary pain points or what are the constraints you have to hitting those financial targets. So it seems like whenever I'm involved, they're very heavy finance focus, which is why I'm there, I guess. But you can put non-financial things on there. It's just not how I think. So we have leads here. And so we can come in and see this on a weekly basis. And these weekly metrics pretty much tell you in real time how the firm is functioning. That if you know sales has a bad week, it's front and center. And so if you're used to EOS, you just say like, hey, sales was off. Let's make that an issue and the leadership team will address it. Then the other piece is we'll also have monthly metrics. So notice the lead volume was on both pages. So I like to see leads on a weekly basis so I can see what's happening within the marketing and sales function on a real time basis. I also want to see those numbers on this monthly page because this lets me know how those functions are performing over time. 
And then we just have, yeah, so billable, build, and collected fees. Um, the other nice thing about 90 is when you start to put together a scorecard like this is you want the marketing team to put their numbers in the system, but you don't want them to see the firm net income or you don't want them to see other metrics. So within 90, you can set permissions that the marketing team can log in, only sees their metrics, they can enter their values, sales team enters their metrics, and then the leadership team can log in and see everything and you're ready for that meeting on Monday or that leadership meeting for the week. So within the financial world, there's a big focus on increasing advisory services. If you're, I don't know if you're seeing that on the side. Um, so this is where you see so many folks talking about CFO services at this point. So we see CFO is trying to make revenue move. So you should be having conversations based more on the metrics we just went through that we use a sophisticated financial modeling tool called Giraffe where we can present actual results and forecast for the next nine to 12 months in a very simple to understand fashion that it's not the pages and pages of spreadsheets to understand that forecast. That's very clear. Entire leadership team has real time access to it. So those monthly finance meetings turn from you know, 90 minutes of spreadsheets to 15 minutes of looking at this nice report. And then we can take the time to start pushing into these metrics. So if CF, real CFO, the way I see it is a lot of these pieces, because we're trying to find those constraints to hitting revenue and margins, that the financial statements are all in the past, the forecast is a forecast, but we need to understand what's holding us back. And I'm always looking for within these tools and these KPIs of, oh, so this firm has this constraint. And so knowing that constraint, that's what's going on my scorecard. And those are the things we're gonna talk about. Um, and then for the following hands folks who have joined us, you're also hearing the push to advisory, but the push is often done at a level from organizations who don't have industry knowledge. So they're trying to do CFO and advisory from a perspective of all companies are the same. So they don't, under, they don't have the understanding of the legal industry or the legal niche that you do. And so from this conversation, I'm hoping you see that you understand all these pieces and you can have these conversations with your clients. All right. So I think that's it. I can't see anything in the hearing is hard, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to have a chat. Okay. I think we need a microphone. He's, he's racing up the side here. And this is also hard because accounting is very structured and precise, where this whole conversation is finance land, where nothing is structured and very ambiguous. Two, two questions for you. So um, how are you pulling these reports? Because the reports you're pulling are actually pretty hard to get out of Clio? Are you spending a lot of time building these reports in Google Sheets? That's question one. And question two, are you going to show us your 90-day and annual KPIs? Oh, the, um, you know, we don't do a whole lot of 90 and annual KPIs. Um, yeah, they haven't gotten that far within 90. For the tools, you know, the first time you export those three spreadsheets out of Excel, and then you, or so you you push those three spreadsheets out of Clio and then you push them into Excel. It can be a real head scratcher on what you're doing, but you know, around that 15th time, it goes a lot quicker. <laughs> so your friend is look, let's see here. I do lookups. Jane, what's your, Jane likes X lookup. I would probably follow her pass. Oh, and it's, it's just, yeah, that's right. You guys have those macros. You've automated a lot of these. Okay. A couple of things. It looked like at some of the other uh, sessions that um, Clio Grow now will integrate with Clio Manage, and we can get both. We can get the information from Clio Grow into Clio Manage. Have you had any? It, it was something I think we just saw. Is that something? Yeah, so this is all new. My comments on Clio Grow 
our watch where that lead attribution occurs? Is it at the client level or is it at the matter level? And the other is I had that get that report out that like, here's my lead report that that was impossible in grow six months ago. There's something in there now that's closer, but if I'm running the marketing department, the most important tool I see is having that leads report mm. with the attribution detail, because if you can't glance into it, it's hard to control. And sorry, thank you for the reminder. The piece that I missed on this is any of that lead attribution detail or any of these reports don't trust the big dashboards within these tools because they're always doing something different than what you expect that you I've been burned so many times on these that you got to pull it down to source data so you can go through and make sure exactly what it's doing before you start to rely on anything. Second question, you really started making a distinction between lead measures and lag measures. Yes. And the it seems like we're always doing lag measures. You didn't go into lead measures. Most of those were lag measures and you tried to make a connection to the lead measure based on a campaign. Can you give us a little insight into something with a lead measure or? Sure. So let's see here. Lead measures for marketing campaigns. So a lead measure would be number of people in our structured referral partner campaign. And then have we had our bi-monthly touch point with every referral partner? For making additional referral partners, do we have a hundred people who should be referral partners who don't know us yet? And are we contacting them? For SEO, I'm looking at trends in organic traffic. So I'm pulling up reports out of um, HREFs and I'm looking at domain rating, number of referring domains, number of keywords, just seeing how strong is that or um, how strong is your SEO presence becoming, that we should see all that trending up. So you go from audience that doesn't know us to captured audience that doesn't know us to captured audience that we have, that's the 100 people, and then from the captured audience, what did we get for, the, for that week or for that month? I'm not. I'll, I'll talk to you. Okay, later. thank you. Yes. Real quick question, thank you. Are you essentially saying that the Clio dashboard is inaccurate? One more time. Are you saying that the Clio dashboard is inaccurate when you look at the metrics? So Clio, well, so it's like some of these nuances. So like Clio Grow, before they did all the changes, you know, that returning client would be flagged as a referral. And that's maybe a nuance on how I see the world, which is different how Clio Grow sees the world. Okay, so it's, it's mostly accurate. Is what you're it depends really what number you're looking at. Okay. Um, oh, the inaccurate part. Sure, so the collected fees that you have to confirm that's right because there's so much transaction volume going through Clio that you have to tie that back to the accounting system to make sure those collections are right. Okay, thank you. When we're talking about payroll ratios, what do you think the goal should be for that percentage? Boy, you know, that's all over the place. That, you know, you certainly hear those consultants who are pushing that the ratio is supposed to be like 0.2, that you should be pulling in you know, like five times labor. We, you know, maybe you could pull that off in PI because those firms have the highest margins that we see. If we can get someone up to three and a half to four, we're pretty happy. Um, it's also a function of culture. You know, if you're a corporate firm, you expect everyone to bill 60 hours a week, well, sure, you can get some amazing ratios, but you're gonna, you know, it's a completely different culture as opposed to a firm that just wants to work their 45 hours a week and go home. Um, but the real answer there is not so much what is the right number, it's where are we today and where do we want to move to? Do we have any other questions? There's one, okay. 
So right now my firm is working on developing stronger targets so that we have this data, we pull it in, and then we can compare it to something. Do you have any recommendations generally for how to come up with those targets? Um, what kind of things do we need to be looking at to make sure that those are really useful to compare our data to? Sure. Could you? Sorry, I can't. Um, so do you have any recommendations for how to develop your targets for this reporting? So how to develop those targets? Because those are hard because you know, part of the EOS world is they'll hire an EOS implementer, which is a, like a generic business consultant who will largely ask the firm, what do you think your KPI should be? And they'll just you know, follow what the firm says where usually I'll come in like understand like, wait a minute, we're not making money. So we're going to change all these KPIs to financially driven pieces. Um, you know, so I'm looking at, so it really depends what's holding the firm back. So there's a lot of nuance to it. The, you know, the expected sales per week as a comparison to revenue is important. Having a very clean budget. So you understand what revenue you need to get the owner their 10, 15% of revenue profit would be starting points. Anybody else? Okay. All right, so again, if you want slides, let us know or send me an email. We're happy to share the deck. <laughs>